Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kufferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. The Kufferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York, is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, economic, social, psychological, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and Indigenous communities. Today's event, Teaching the Beauty and Breaking, a workshop for educators, features Queensboro Community College professors and KHC-National Endowment for the Humanities Fellows, Dr. Angela Reidinger Dotterman and Dr. Ilsa Schreinemakers, who will both share pedagogical strategies for integrating Dr. Michelle Harper's book, The Beauty and Breaking, into the KHC's Nazi concentration camps, virtual and in-person exhibition. The Common Read text, which is Dr. Harper's book, is a common intellectual experience that promotes integrative learning across the disciplines through multidisciplinary approaches to a common text. Participating faculty members are able to incorporate this text in a way that aligns with their individual interests and disciplines. Students participate in cross-disciplinary events, which provide an opportunity for increased social and academic engagement while supporting the learning that takes place in the classroom. In her book, Dr. Harper, who's a surgeon, shares her memories from inside the emergency room and her own spiritual journey towards healing from trauma. It connects with our professional development workshop today, which is part of the 2022-23 KHC and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Trauma, Remembrance, and Compassion. It's also co-sponsored by the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, also known as CEDL, here at QCC. We're hosting today's event in a Zoom meeting format, so you'll be able to interact with both professors, and you can post your questions by the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Now to kick things off, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ilsa Schreinemakers, who is an associate professor in the English department here at QCC, where she serves as deputy chair and primarily teaches first year composition courses. Also joining her is Dr. Angela Reidinger Dotterman, who's also associate professor of English here at QCC, where she teaches courses in composition and early American literature. And her scholarly interests include composition pedagogy, representations of disability in literature, and women's activism in the 19th century American literature. Turn it over to my colleagues. The floor is yours. So just to give you a bit of context, if you are not familiar with this year's NEHKHC Colloquium series, this year's series is called Trauma Remember Passion. And in this series, we are examining trauma both within the context of the Holocaust and within our contemporary culture, as well as considering how remembrance and compassion offer meaningful responses to atrocities. This colloquium series is the collaborative effort um, of the executive director of the KHC, uh, Dr. Laura Cohen, the associate director, Marissa Hollywood, as well as this year's faculty fellows. Um, in addition to Ilsa and I, um, our colleagues, Jody Vanderhorn Gibson, an associate professor of communication theater and media production, and John Yi, a lecturer of English here at Queensboro, um, have collaborated to create this year's colloquium series. I also want to tell you a little bit about the Common Read. If you're unfamiliar with uh, Common Read programs or, or even just the way the Common Read program works here at Queensboro Community College, um, the Common Read is uh, a version of the common intellectual experience, and it's designated by the American Association of Colleges and Universities as a high impact practice. Um, high impact practices are identified as such based on um, evidence of significant educational benefits for students who participate in them, including and especially those from demographic groups historically underserved by higher education. At QCC, the Common Read text is selected each year by an interdisciplinary committee 
During the fall semester, faculty across the disciplines read and discuss the common read text. We participate in planning to incorporate the text into our classes. We prepare student-facing assignments and reflection prompts in support of the common read learning outcomes. And then we plan events for the spring semester. When we come to the spring semester, faculty incorporate the common read text into our courses in a variety of ways. Some faculty members teach the entire text while others teach a portion of the text. And we have faculty teaching the, the class across all disciplines at QCC. The culmination of the common read every year is the common read events. And this is a really fun period of about a couple of weeks during which students attend events um, consisting of both in-person events and virtual modalities connected to the common read text. The events are interdisciplinary in focus. Students have the opportunity to explore how the common read text has been incorporated into other disciplines and to make cross-disciplinary connections. Um, and they also have a chance to connect with their peers across campus who have read the same text. This year's common read text is Michelle Harper's Beauty and Breaking, a memoir. Just to give you an overview of the text, um, Harper's memoir is written as a series of related essays that can be read sequentially or separately. Each chapter focuses on Harper's experiences with brokenness and healing in the wake of childhood trauma and her recent divorce. And each chapter features a narrative of one or sometimes two patients that she treats in the ER. The first two chapters of the memoir really anchor Harper's story. She is um, the subject of both of these chapters. She's first Michelle, um, and she discloses her own experiences with domestic violence as a child, um, which impel her to become a doctor. And then the second chapter focuses on her identity as Dr. Harper um, and how her early experiences as an intern shape her approach to caregiving. And then the rest of the memoir moves into focusing on different patients. Um, and the narratives of each patient focus on one of a wide variety of topics. So ranging from mental health, um, sexual assault, policing, child abuse, terminal illness, um, sudden infant death syndrome, um, substance abuse. Many of these chapters also develop an aspect of the healthcare profession that intersects with the chapter's focus. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I'll be sharing a little bit about the author of the text. Um, as you can see here on the left, uh, she's a graduate of Harvard University and the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University. Uh, she's been a physician for over a decade in various hospitals, the chief resident at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx, and an attending physician in the emergency department at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Philadelphia. So in lieu of having her here with us, um, I'd like to play a short clip of her introducing herself and sharing some of her background that led to her life calling. Um, and that's the publication of this book. The clip is about 11 minutes long. It's the shortest <laughs> that I could find. But I think for our purposes, uh, the first three minutes or so um, is sufficient. So um, it's when she discusses the moment she realizes she had to be an ER doctor and how that tied with her early childhood trauma. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here with you all today. So thank you. And to my esteemed co-panelists, I have a deep respect for you all. My name is Michelle Harper, and I wrote uh, the memoir, The Beauty and Breaking. And this memoir explores journeys of healing and the possibilities therein from the challenges that life will most certainly throw at us. And I understood that viscerally as a child growing up in a violent, unstable household with a batterer uh, for a father. And so early I learned what it took to survive. Often I would just have a snapshot in time, just a moment to do a risk assessment. And in that moment, I would have to decide, is there danger right now? Do we, we, myself, my mother, my brother, my sister, do we have to make an intervention to live right now? Or per perhaps it's not so dangerous, it'll just blow over, just need to give it a little time. Or maybe this is actually a moment of relative calm. So it turns out this is the exact skill set I would need late, years later as an ER doctor. And so 
I realized in my youth that spaces that house us may not actually be home, that people and institutions that are supposed to protect us may just be experiences that must be survived. And one day, somehow, without knowing what it looks like beyond survival, I would have to figure out what it is to live. And then one day I did get a glimpse of it. Uh, one day when my brother was protecting my mother from my father beating her, which, which could have been any day. But, but this day my brother was injured, which also could have been one of various days. But on this day, I was a teenager just learning to drive and I had my permit. So I drove my brother to the ER when he needed care. And when we got there, I saw all manner of life converging in this space as I waited for him. And whether or not it was a homeless man who just needed a couple hours respite from the elements, a safe, warm, dry place to rest, or a little girl who came in crying, carried in because she had a cut on her leg, and then later emerges skipping and laughing with her dad because she's all fixed, or a man presumably in cardiac arrest because there are paramedics pumping oxygen into his lungs, thumping his chest to circulate his blood. And then family members that I see streaming in and, and one way or another, with or without them, they too will have to figure out the next chapters of their lives. And there was something special in seeing our interconnectedness as humans, something special in realizing that I wasn't alone, that we're in this together, this mission of healing, knowing that after the breaking, it is possible to mend if we choose it. And if there are people there who will offer assistance, even if it's just a stranger in the ER for an hour or for the duration of her shift. So I chose it. And when I grew up and became an emergency medicine physician, I could not look away. I could not unknow or unhear the experiences of my patients nor myself. Okay. So that gives us a sort of a small glimpse there of her motivation for becoming an ER doctor. And then of course, a writer of this memoir in which stories of her patients are central, even at times seeming more central than her own story. This memoir was very well received with a starred review in Publishers Weekly, among other honors. Okay. So she, in that brief introduction that, that she gave to us, um, Michelle frequently references this idea of a healing journey. And so in the next few slides, I'll be sharing an up-close look at one particular chapter from the memoir and some ways to approach the text. Uh, one way is right here uh, with the question of, well, what is a healing journey? Um, and to have students share insights on what the word healing uh, might mean to them. What is meant by this term is a great starting point for discussion, I think, with our students. So I found the student, uh, the study, which looked at the term from perspectives of many patients as a way to begin this conversation in the classroom. So the first two quotes share conclusions reached about the term's definition. And the last quote gives an overview of the different ways others have defined it. So I'll just share that with you. Um, so the first quote in the healing journey, bridges from suffering are developed to healing resources, skills, and connections to helpers outside themselves. These bridges often evolve in fits and starts and involve persistence and developing a sense of safety and trust. From the iteration between suffering and developing resources and connections, a new state emerges that involves hope, self-acceptance, and helping others. Over time, this leads to healing. And I found those that trajectory very relevant um, as I to my students as I'm teaching the chapters in the memoir. Um, and on the bottom quote here, we have different takes on the meaning of healing. Um, we describing healing as a transformational change, transcending suffering, a journey from feeling ill to wellness, 
an emphasis on recovery and regaining a sense of balance and peace. Define healing as making whole again, reducing suffering when cure is not possible and finding meaning beyond the illness experience. So um, I found this very interesting that students might need this sort of grounding before or during the exploration of the text and find useful ways about how the healing may signify a variety of experiences and not just one instance and thereby open up more discussion and communication from different viewpoints um, in the classroom. So let's take a look um, at an individual chapter to see how Michelle's healing journey is captured in the text. And it's interesting to see, um, not sure how many of you have read the book yet, but to see how she really maps out in each chapter a certain structure to communicate the stealing stages of her road to recovery of this healing journey. Um, and I find looking at the structure a useful way into the text to initiate analysis with my students. So uh, we actually started the semester with, we're just starting the book right now, and we started with chapter 10. Um, why did I choose chapter 10? I mean, after the intro, of course, um, is because it's, it's one of the most hopeful stories. Um, and I thought that might be a good way to sort of discuss this journey of healing to begin with a chapter that has a happy ending of sorts. Um, and so I'm just going to, as is typical of her chapters, um, the opening begins with Harper sharing a phase in her own sort of emotional, psychological journey. So I'll just read, with, um, read for you the opening passage from the chapter. I sat craving stillness and knowing there was no other way to it than to let the craving go to allow it to pass. I thought of a quote um, of the renowned spiritual leader and peace activist, letting go gives us freedom and freedom is the only condition for happiness. If in our heart, we still cling to anything, anger, anxiety, or possessions, we cannot be free. So I sat there waiting, trying not to grip too hard after the last line of the chant. Um, and then she talks about this being a regular routine of hers and the walk itself as part of a ritual. Um, and then as typical in the chapter, soon after some type of self-reflection about her emotional and mental state, um, she encounters her ER patients, right? She, it's, it's a random, she doesn't know who's going to enter um, the emergency room that day. And so in that, this particular chapter, she has two, two ER patients. Um, the first one is the first um, square uh, rectangle there. I double checked her electronic medical record, Olivia Hernandez, 57 year old female with a history of hypertension, anemia, reflux, and being overweight. Her only medication was HCTZ for her blood pressure. No allergies. Her medical records showed she had a regular medical follow-ups and was pretty healthy. All appeared unremarkable. And that's in contrast to her second patient. It was a very dramatic story. Um, he's a, an alcoholic, and he, and here's the blurb where we where we meet that patient for the first time. Um, he continued. Yesterday, I blacked out and woke up this afternoon with my bedroom door on the floor. I don't think I ever fixed it right. The two empty bottles of vodka were on the floor from I don't know where. I had voicemail from work since I was a no-show and one from my five-year-old son who I hadn't seen in three weeks. So today I drove myself in. Um, and so he's admitting that he needs help and you can continue reading that there. Um, so a lot happens. I don't want to give too much away, but a lot happens in the chapter. And, um, because she is narrating this sort of healing journey, what happens towards the end of the chapter, um, and which I began to expect, um, now that I'm in chapter 10, um, is that she connects this encounter with her patients to her own personal healing process. And she so she builds a pretty tight narrative of showing herself as thinking about this topic at the beginning of the chapter and then ending with some type of way in which her encounters with the patients have enriched her and enriched her own personal self-development. So I'll just read this a portion of it here. As I waited for the new patients to be triaged, I considered the journeys of Mr. Wade and Ms. Hernandez. Mr. Wade's door to healing 
had opened in a loud and dramatic way by armed men who had literally come knocking at his door before breaking it down. He had been passed out on the floor, a limp heap of a man, and then he had been jolted awake. Mr. Miss Hernandez called came quietly, a slow throb at her temples, a dull ache of fatigue that gouted her to check out just in case. And then she she begins to contemplate both these patients had let go in their own ways as they move towards health. And she questions, isn't that how healing usually happens? Um, so, so from her encounters, her takeaway is significant to her personal journey towards wellness and her patients are her guiding, helping her on the spiritual path towards um, towards healing. So as an educator, the question becomes, um, so how do I make this analysis, the structure of the book relevant to our students? I teach composition, one of the core courses required of force year students. And this is my first time teaching this book. But fortunately for my students, they have access to the wonderful resources of the Kufferberg Holocaust Center, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but for now, um, I want to share a writing assignment, which invites analysis of our students to think about brokenness and beauty and healing that can emerge from suffering. But I kind of wondered, how do I engage students with such deeply personal topics and at the same time maintain an inclusive classroom? How to consider a way to invite discussion that invites all students away into the subject matter to keep them you know, at a comfort level. So taking a cue from the introduction of Harper's memoir, in which she references the Japanese art of fixing broken objects, which layers in a spiritual value to this process of repairing broken objects, which in this case is gold paint, and finding new beauty in detailing the brokenness. And so I'd like to share with you um, this short clip that I also share with my students um, as a way into this type of reflection narration assignment um, that comes at the topic of the memoir um, from a different angle. この私は京都で修復師をしておりますえ、清川博人と申します。この世界に入って45年 金継ぎの技法を使うのはやはり器が中心ですね。ご先祖さんが使ってた器であったり、お気に入りの器であったり、やはり何かの思いが入ってる器の修理に使われてきましたね。金継ぎをした箇所っていうのは、いわば一つの
日本人と漆っていうのは切っても切れない関係にあります漆の樹液自体は非常に貴重なもの日本の漆っていうのは一本の木からそのポップ一杯をいただいた時点で伐採になります Okay, I'll stop it there because I want to be sure to leave time for Q&A. But it's a wonderful resource、um, into the topic, and、um, it's,、uh, it's easily available to you all.、Um, so after sharing that, that video with the students,、um, I'll invite them to consider,、um, and they have to do so in the assignment, which you see here on the left, to select some type of, of object that has meaning to them and to、um, explore the significance of the broken object. To the reader, and then describe the process of repairing the object, considering what did you do and why? What has changed about the object? What new meaning does the object hold for you and why? And then they're invited to bring in、um, a particular paragraph or passage or quotation. This is、um, a first year writing course、uh, for beauty and breaking, and that discusses brokenness and, and the journey towards healing and repair. And then in the last paragraph, sort of、um, do some analysis and thinking about that. So, hopefully, by sharing this with you, sort of this type of approach, you're welcome to take part of the assignment or, or adjust it or <laughs> turn it into a much, much smaller project.、Um, but I have found so far that this emphasis on objects and something tangible has worked really well with my students in conjunction with, talk, with reading the very personal nature of、um, Harper's experiences. Next up, my students、um, for the next unit,、um, they take the students to the Holocaust、um, and they'll be spending time in the space of the Holocaust Center.、Um, and we can see just at these, I don't know how many of you have had or、uh, live near the center, have had a chance to be in the center.、Um, but one of the great things about the exhibit、um, is that it's a very, this new exhibit has a very, is a very tactile experience with the bricks and the wood on the walls and the replica of the iron gates and the narrowness of the space. Um, and that works quite well, having just sort of worked with students、um, thinking about、uh, a physical object.、Um, and you can see, so hold on.、Uh, so the exhibit works with the students on so many different levels. They see the photographs of the brutal, of the brutal system and the people suffering,、um, and hear the stories from the survivors.、Um, and it can be in close proximity to the artifacts and be in this enclosed space. Um, and so, my students, given their recent writing on broken objects and the, and the details about Kristallnacht,、uh, the night of the broken glass, becomes a specific bridge that I plan to use between the course's two units.、Um, so, I encourage everyone to spend some time either with the center's recording,、um, uh, the virtual exhibit, or to the physical space. There's also a、um, wonderful list of Uh, the resources back catalog, and I've created a list here of, of ones that are work really well with the teaching of、um, Michelle Harper's、uh, memoir. So, next, I'll share a possible research、uh, project before turning the stage over to Angela.、Um, and、uh, one of the Questions that can emerge from the, from the pairing of Harper's memoir with the exhibit, with this focus on the journey of healing, is that how is healing even possible given the enormity of the Holocaust、um, and the enormity of the pain evident in the testimony of the survivors? My students listen to the survivors' stories.、Um, for students, it's really tough, but an important question. And so, for their research project, students are asked to challenge themselves to think about what they can do locally to, to be change agents in their immediate environments, working with their own life experiences and building from what they have witnessed, learned about, and responded to、um, in the exhibit. So, on the next slide here, what you'll see、um, is、uh, the product of the research project that I assigned them to do.、Um, The, the, the students are, for their final research project, engage with the research question of what problem, however they wish to define the term, would they like to provide solutions for? In other words, how do they want to be a change agent? And the way into that is to have my students they design a mock nonprofit agency in terms of a mission statement, a founder's biography that offers some type of solution or remedy or assistance with this problem. So, Um, thinking about that healing journey、um, and how they can be、um, agents of creating change in their own community. 
The caveat is that the they must create this nonprofit agency out of some aspect of their own ethos, their own lived experience, thinking which ties in with very well with Michelle Harper's uh, memoir in which her her impetus for all that she does and her whole healing process is tied to her biography um, in which she positions herself as a healer because of what she went through with her youth. So after the students' virtual interactions with the Holocaust exhibit and reflections about the Holocaust survivor stories, many students focus do focus on racial healing that you'll see. These are the slides from their um, creative project that they create. Um, but there's also a wide range in terms of how students approach this topic. Um, and the two that I'll just highlight quickly, um, the Cancer Crusader slide on the lower um, right there is one student really built upon the value of hearing the survivor testimony as therapeutic and wanted to create an archive resource of stories from survivors of cancer to uplift the, the spirits of anyone going through uh, treatment. His own grandmother had passed away from cancer because she would, and he, and he admitted, uh, because she would not listen to anyone, the doctors, the family, or other cancer patients. And so he he was trying to find a way to help others um, uh, survive and deal and, and feel compassion. Um, and then the middle slide there about real facts, a student wanted to create an organization um, uh, in which news media had to report just the facts, a little bit you know, idealistic, but the student discussed his parents' treatment in NYC in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 as Muslims and the fear in which they lived as a result of the spread of disinformation. He drew parallels to the propaganda during the Nazi regime, what he had learned from the exhibit from the Holocaust Center, and he wanted to start an organization that focused just on the facts. Um, so those are the different ways in which I'm taking an approach to teaching the text and, and, and making the Holocaust Center the central focus for that student engagement with these core um, humanistic questions. The floor is now back to you, Angela. Thank you so much, Elsa. That is fantastic. So <clears throat> I have been really interested in how Harper is using narrative to perform an act of care in her memoir. And it seems to me when I look at um, most of the chapters of her memoir, they, they also have another formula appears to me, um, which is that Harper chooses to tell the individual story to give voice to the individual experience of injustice. So the example that I selected is from chapter seven in the name of honor. And chapter seven shares the experience of a woman named Victoria Honor, who was uh, the victim of sexual assault when she was in the military in Afghanistan. So Within the chapter, we see Harper give voice to the individual experience of injustice. Um, we have the passage here. This is exactly why I had asked. On some level, I already knew or sensed what had happened. I also knew that the other part of the atrocity was the silencing. Some would say that the even greater part of the crime was forcing the survivor to hold that trauma alone, knowing the revelation would risk exposing her to blame, judgment, and additional consequences. It is only in the speaking of abuses that we can address them. It is only in speaking of violence that the cycle can be broken instead of replicated day after day in our subconscious, year after year in our lives. What Harper then often does is she links the individual experience of injustice or trauma to some aspect of systemic brokenness. And in in this chapter, she talks about the larger culture of the, the military that had permitted sexual assault to go unaddressed. She writes, the man who did this couldn't have acted alone. He committed his atrocities because the military allows these crimes within their culture of institutionalized misogyny and toxic masculinity, because our criminal justice system is based on the same, because our nation was founded on accountability. Come, let's you and me take steps together into change. And then finally, what she does is Harper affirms the humanity of the individual. And she does this by making room for her story. So she says, I had allowed the store to open. In fact, I had opened it because I was committed to acknowledging Vicky 
her experience and her humanity. I had committed myself to being her provider in this way. So I braced myself for a walk across what was certainly exceedingly hard terrain. And over and over again in Beauty and Breaking, we see Harper making this narrative move of turning her focus toward the trauma, to acknowledge the trauma, to acknowledge the brokenness, um, to name it, to, to, to put it in the larger context, and then to bring the focus back toward the individual um, in order to recenter their humanity. So this importance of the narrative framework, I got to thinking about how um, I might work with this um, in the context of the KHC exhibit. And for the past, um, really the past three years, like uh, many of you, um, I've been teaching my courses in a mostly online modality. And um, indeed the KHC exhibit, the first uh, encounters I was able to have with it um, and the first encounters um, my students have been able to have with it is in the, the online version of the exhibit. The exhibit actually um, was available to us initially um, as a virtual exhibit and, and then became available um, once campus reopened as a physical space. And so I have had a, a kind of a, a longer relationship with this exhibit um, than certainly my, my students this fall will have, but I also have, um, I ha also have the benefit of having thought of it in a couple of different ways. And um, one of the things that I've been really interested in in working with the exhibit is how it also has um, engaged in the process of creating and centering a narrative. Um, and it, it does that like most um, museum exhibits, it does that not just through um, a written narrative, but really does so through selection of artifacts and visual text. So I teach my English 102 class, which at QCC is a second semester composition class, and it's also introduction to literature class, with a focus on readings from the field of disability studies. And um, over the course of the semester, I ask students to read various texts written by um, authors with disabilities. We talk about assumptions of able-bodiedness in literature. Um, we talk about representations of care and failures of care with, within these texts. And um, so one of the parts of the um, exhibit that uh, I have focused on quite a bit has been the, the section on the the murder of children and the developmentally disabled. And um, this discusses, of course, the, the T4 program and the elimination of children with disabilities as, as some of the first um, victims of the Nazi um, program of euthanasia. Um, and I think that this is something that to the, to the extent which students are aware of the Holocaust, they are often less aware um, that this, this was a, an initial focus. Um, and so um, I have been really interested in um, helping students to uh, turn toward that history. And I'm sharing a couple of pictures here from um, the first, the first one is um, a photograph of unmarked graves at Hadamar. And I first worked with this image um, as part of the Jack and Anita Hess uh, Foundation 2022 um, faculty um, seminar. Uh, it was focusing on bioethics disease and the Holocaust. And we, um, with my colleagues in, in the faculty seminar, we talked about how this photographic um, evidence serves to provide um, really the only um, evidence of remembrance of, of these children who have otherwise been forgotten. Their identities aren't known, um, but this, this site, this physical space is really the one um, 
what is left of them. And for those who can't travel to the physical space, then the photographic evidence really serves this 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 very important part of telling their stories. And it it speaks to us in a way that just um, a few sentences explaining to us that um, the children um, having been killed um, in Hadamar really couldn't. And um, then from this, I um, show students a photograph um, which is taken uh, actually just upstate in, in upstate New York and in, in Westchester of uh, unmarked graves in Letchworth Village. And Letchworth Village was a, um, uh, I guess, a, a, an institution, we would call it an institution um, for disabled children um, that was open in the United States during the 20th century. And there were many students who died um, within, uh, while they were in the care at Letchworth Village. And um, they have also largely been forgotten, uh, but for the efforts of um, a, a small group that has worked to preserve their history. So um, it's okay, you can, you can go for it, that's all right. So I became interested in the possibility um, of students using, um, using visual evidence to curate their own digital exhibits. Um, to find a story connected to um, a population that um, that has largely been forgotten or whose story doesn't get told often enough or loudly enough. And to use the, the format of the exhibit to draw attention um, to that community. So I'm actually going to share in the chat because I just have like a snip of the assignment, but I can share the whole assignment with you. So the first thing I will share is, actually I'll just share, I'm gonna share two things. So, the, the, I'll talk about the, the first link that I've, which I'm calling preservation as an act of care. And um, all semester long, students in my course are interacting with the concept of care. And um, I'm using the beauty and breaking to really ground that conversation. So we're really in the early stages of this as a class. Um, we've just started off with um, like some informal in-class activities like a, a Jamboard um, where students are asked to just associate, you know, say what their associations are with, with just the concept of care. So what does, what does care mean? Um, what does care look like? What does it look like when care fails? How do you care for somebody? And getting students accustomed to talking about the concept of care. And then as we move forward through our exploration of the book, we're going to engage in the process um, that, that I described um, a couple of slides ago, at looking at, you know, how is the narrative serving to engage in an act of care by identifying the individual injustice, by putting, taking the, the, taking the injustice out of, realm of the realm of just being personally experienced and looking at it as a societal responsibility and then using the, the narrative itself um, to recenter and restore the individual's humanity. So I'll be doing that with my students during the month of February and March. When we get into the April, um, then we are going to engage in an extended exploration of both the virtual and in-person KHC exhibit. So I'm going to start with my students by looking at the online exhibit and talking about how is the exhibit curated? How is it organized? Um, who are the populations that um, the exhibit focuses on? What stories does the exhibit attempt to tell? 
And then we have arranged to um, visit the KHC together as a class. And I'm going to have my students look at the physical space. Um, we're going to talk about the differences between physical exhibits and digital exhibits, what each offers. Um, and we'll be looking, the, looking at like considering that as, as kind of an act so if you have the physical objects or, or the in-person experience, which I think we can all agree is distinctly different from a virtual experience, how can we thoughtfully try to recreate that inside of, um, inside of a two-dimensional space, essentially inside of the space of a, of a digital text? And students will examine and consider the use of different kinds of texts, um, as well as the functions of space and relationship in order to develop a narrative. And then the end of that is a research project where students identify a focus for their digital exhibits and they engage in research, they will go to the writing center, um, and then at the end of the semester, they will be sharing their digital exhibits with the class. I became really interested in this connection between multimodal composition and storytelling after reading um, Nick Susenis' book on flattening, um, which I'll show you here. Um, and I just wanted to point to a few passages from his, from his text that I think may help you um, understand how I'm thinking about these two things together. So the first thing that he notes um, that, that I want to point to is, uh, he says, traditionally, words have been privileged as the proper mode of explanation, as the tool of thought, Images have, on the other hand, long been sequestered to the realm of spectacle and aesthetics, sidelined in serious discussions as mere illustration to support the text, never as equal partner. And the more time that I've spent interacting with um, both the digital exhibit as well as in personal exhibits and museum spaces, I've become uh, convinced that this really isn't um, the appropriate way to think about visual texts or their power um, or potential, that they really need to be made equal partner um, with the written text in the formation of a narrative because um, that, that visual element um, helps to helps to create something that words by themselves um, often cannot. Um, he also says that uh, stories who are a kind of doorway, openings, vehicles to transport us, as the stories within stories of Shehel, Scheherazade show stories, stories sustain us and offer spaces of freedom. They reach across time and space to share in another's viewpoint, touch another's thoughts, and make them part of our own stories. To be clear by stories, I don't mean only wondrous tales, but that most human of activities, the framing of experience to give it meaning. Now, Susanus, um, if you are not familiar with his text, he's, it's actually um, uh, a really interesting discursive exploration of, of rhetoric and narrative. Um, but it's rendered entirely in graphic form. So it's rendered uh, almost like, you know, it looks like a comic book. Um, but there's a deep meaning in, in his, his act of presenting it that way. And um, so when he's talking about frames, he's not like just talking about narrative frames, but he's actually talking about specific visual frames. Um, and I like that pairing of things because in in Harper's memoir we have this narrative frame um, that she's using to to center these larger topics connected to the healthcare industry or to connected connected to systemic brokenness. Um, but then when we're thinking about creating visual text, we're we're thinking about frames also in a different way, not just the way that we we frame a narrative, but the, the actual physical frame or the way that we're organizing things in space with each other. Um, and as, as Susanna says, as you will recall, through the, through the action of mentally binding and framing separate concepts, we generate new understandings. Stories provide us with such frames, openings through which to pass. These frames we construct are workspaces to blend ideas, sites of transformation. So this year in the KHC NEH colloquium series, there have actually been a number of events um, that have been recorded um, that look particularly at 
this this issue of remembrance um, specifically through images and um, in particular uh, digital images and the possibilities that technology have have created. Um, just last week, we had an event with Dr. Lindy, Lindy Lauer called Deconstructing Atrocity Imagery. Um, and then last semester, we had several events as well. Um, we had Trauma in Digital Spaces, the Future of Holocaust Remembrance, um, that looked at um, uh, the use of holographs, actually, um, as uh, a way to create remembrance in museum spaces. Um, we had an event uh, a week later, the digitization of genocide memory consequences and contestation to talk about some of the possibilities that are that are made available by these new digital technologies, as well as some of the, the issues that arise from that way of looking. Um, we had an event uh, focusing on graphic memoirs, um, exploring messy roots, a graphic memoir of a Wuhanese American, which um, looked at, among other things, the representation of um, this individual experience through the visual medium of the graphic memoir. And we also had a, um, an event, uh, a workshop event, that featured the curator from the cage, this, uh, from this current exhibit, um, Dr. Carrie Lane. Um, where he discussed really the choices that he made as the curator for the KHC concentration camps exhibit. And I have found all of those resources um, helpful, not just to me in terms of um, shaping my thinking about the text and, and interactions I can create with my students in the exhibit, um, but also helpful for my students. My students have um, viewed several of these um, and I will ask them to view them again. And um, they have found these really interesting ways of helping them think about um, visual texts and the creation of narrative and the creation of, of, of remembrance. So, Last semester, um, I just want to kind of show you briefly what that assignment looked like, that digital exhibits assignment. Um, the, the students, um, so I, I should clarify that, that last time I, I taught the digital exhibits assignment, I asked my students to specifically focus on a connection um, to the field of disability studies. So they were looking at disability communities, they were looking at um, issues that affected um, populations with disabilities, sometimes they were looking at abuse. This semester I am opening it up a little bit more because um, my class uh, focus has shifted just a little bit um, to encompass the, the larger um, issue of care. So my students are going to have the opportunity to write about some uh, present research on some topic related to care, either a community or um, a population that has experienced a, a lack of care or an issue that comes up in caregiving, um, as well as they can they can look at intersections with the field of disabilities. So on the left, you see one one student did this really very interesting thing in his digital exhibit. I'm only showing you a couple of slides from it. Um, but he actually thought about the entire museum space. And he thought about how his exhibit would be divided into different rooms and he gave a map um, of the different rooms of this exhibit. And then in each room, he um, presented artwork, his his exhibit focused on um, artwork by deaf artists. And he, so he, he showed us like this gallery view of the artwork. And then he had slides like the one that's here um, on the bottom left, that's kind of uh, covered up, um, where he gave an analysis and provided, um, uh, provided additional resources for a, for a museum a viewer um, who would like to know more about this painting. And it was a really, really neat approach to the assignment. He really um, made this two-dimensional text very, very 3D. 
Um, on the right is a student who whose response was maybe a, a little bit more typical in terms of dimensionality. It was really um, much more just a, a, a 2D or virtual exhibit. Um, but his was focusing on uh, the preservation of disability history by by looking at a preservation by looking at the, the Paralympic Games, and um, you can see that you know he did things like have a close up view of um, the running blades that are used by some um, uh, by some of the athletes in the Paralympic Games. Then he has another slide where he was showing some of the devices that were used. But overall, he did this, this great job of um, making someone comfortable with the, or I guess familiar with rather than comfortable with, making somebody familiar with this history that I think otherwise gets gets overlooked and creating an immersive ex exhibit experience. And I will say, um, if you haven't opened the assignment sheet, I'll tell you, um, I asked students along with the visual exhibit that they create to write a curator's note. And the curator's note is really important because I'm asking them not just to, to describe the exhibit that they've created, um, but to really think of themselves as being in the role of the curator who is, who is in essence a storyteller and to think about, um, to, to be able to share with their audience why they selected the artifacts that they selected to create the story, what the goal of this narrative that they have created is. Um, and I also asked them to reflect a bit on um, how this exhibit comes out of their own understanding of the concept of care. I want them to connect this um, to their, their learning and our exploration of care throughout the semester, which includes Harper's memoir, The Beauty and Break. Um, a variation on this assignment, um, which is um, a little less involved in terms of a, a visual component um, than the digital exhibit assignment is, but it's the second um, it's the second Google Doc that I dropped into the chat if you want to access it, um, is also a connection to the KHC exhibit. And this is um, the concept of resistance. So it seems to me that Harper's memoir, um, when you read it start to finish, one of the things that she really is doing is she's trying to, um, she's trying to resist, I guess, um, the uh, both the injustices that she's witnessed either personally or that she witnesses in her patients. I think in the telling there is there is a resistance, there is a, a calling out of what has happened. Um, and I think in her, her desire to speak up, she resists becoming, you know, part of this system that can often um, be dehumanizing, dehumanizing, a system that can often um, see patients as, as sort of problems or numbers and not really see them as people. Um, so I see it as a resistant text. And I have been um, interested in exploring with my students, you know, ways that we can resist through these acts of creativity, like telling a story. So um, an alternative assignment that I have given students um, in past semesters that I think could also work really well with the beauty and breaking as a, as a background for it, um, is to ask students to engage in the the buildup is fairly the same um, we look at the concept of resistance we we have talked about the concept of creativity over the semester we have engaged with the KHC exhibit um, and then I've asked students to think about how um, creativity can be used to resist um, and to connect that to um, their research on a group that is experiencing injustice in our contemporary society. So students have identified all kinds of different groups, sometimes directly connected to the course readings. Maybe they're familiar, you know, we, we look at readings about undocumented immigrants. We look at um, 
readings about microaggressions. Um, we've looked at um, readings connected to the transgender community. So sometimes they're making connections directly to a community that we've already explored. Sometimes students are making connections to a community that, that I'm not even aware of, um, but they present research about, um, you know, what, what is the injustice that that community is facing? What is, um, you know, who's the perpetrator of the injustice? Um, what needs to be done to eliminate the suffering? And they, um, they then, along with the research, they're asked to produce an act of creative resistance and to talk about why they took that act of creative resistance. And the responses have been wonderful. I would love to share them with you, but unfortunately, um, I've had students primarily share them through video videoed presentations, um, which I don't have their permission to share, but um, they've had really neat responses. A lot of them have um, written poetry, which has surprised me, but they've found poetry a very um, powerful act of creative resistance. I even had a student who um, had her poem published um, following the assignment. Her, she circulated it for publication, which was, which was fantastic. It was a Accepted. Um, I've had students uh, complete paintings. I've had students create um, their own uh, um, graphic texts, um, like cartoons. Um, I've had students um, create hashtags and talk about like how they would circulate the hashtag in the public in order to create resistance. I've had some students write speeches. So they've had some really interesting responses. Um, and, and I think that this has also been, would also work very well with the beauty and breaking as a backdrop. So just um, to kind of look forward, as part of the common read events period, um, later this semester, we are planning to welcome Dr. Rita Sharon um, from, uh, Columbia University. Um, and she is the founder of the field of narrative medicine. Um, she is a Harvard trained physician with a PhD in literature. It's, it's actually very interesting. She became a doctor. And then about 20 years later, she got a PhD in English literature. Um, I believe she is still working on a book about Henry James. She's the founding chair and professor of medical humanities and ethics and the professor of medicine at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And um, she was the 2018 Jefferson lecturer in the humanities. And in, the, in his introduction for her, um, John Parrish Peed wrote, quote, in her pioneering work in narrative medicine, Rita Jaron has shown the amazing power of the humanities in healing both mind and body. So um, Dr. Sharon is going to be speaking with our students um, in an event that's co-sponsored by the KHC and the Common Read at QCC um, to talk about um, what the field of narrative medicine is um, and then how um, narrative medicine is really the foundation for medical ethics um, and how narratives um, serve to you know, restore um, humanity in a system that can often be otherwise humanized. And we anticipate that event to be on Wednesday, March 22nd um, at noon. Thank you so much for attending. And we, um, if you have questions or um, thoughts, uh, please feel free to share them in the chat. And Ilsa and I will respond to them. It's all right. I'm not super fast typer. I have a question. <laughs> yeah, so these, yeah. Are, these are amazing projects. Um, and it's so interesting, the connections that you've made to the exhibit, to the book. Um, they're just, they're beautiful projects. So the, the first question I had is, how do you think, or how are you seeing these types of projects affecting the pass rates for your courses? Um, are you seeing any correlations with that? Are you seeing students be more engaged with these projects? Um, I would definitely say introducing the element of creativity and um, having them go into the exhibit with um, 
merging what's the content of the exhibit with the reflection about how it relates to themselves and their reaction to it all has been pretty powerful. Um, and um, in terms of pass rates, I don't I don't know if I can, I can do a direct alignment, but I would say um, that it, there's definitely an enthusiastic engagement um, and a sense of pride when they go to the KHC exhibit and they experience it, that this is on their campus. And so finding a way to tie that to text that I'm using all semester and assignments that I'm giving um, definitely has been um, an, an important part of my curriculum. What would you say, Angela? Yeah, I would say that now I kind of want to go, actually, that you've asked that question, Marissa, and can't answer that particular part, but what I, what I will say is true is if students, I, I actually can't think of a student who got to the point of the semester when I asked them to complete either of these projects and did not complete the project. So there were students who maybe, maybe hadn't been participating, missed one of the initial assignments and, and they didn't do this. But in terms of the students who got to, you know, got to month two and a half of the semester and they were engaged in the class, this was something that they became very enthusiastic about. And this seemed to be something that enabled them to finish the semester really well. And the quality of the work, I think, was much better than it would have been if I had only assigned a research paper, you know, or if I had assigned a traditional research paper that did not ask students to engage in a kind of creative multimodal assignment. And that was actually a bit surprising to me, um, not because I had designed an assignment thinking, gee, this will be great, nobody will finish it, but just because um, I guess initially I was concerned that students might be daunted by the additional technology I was asking them to use or engage with in order to complete the assignment. But, but that turned out not to be true. Um, one of my favorite one of my favorite responses um, to the creative resistance was actually a student who wrote a poem. It was a great poem. And she was a strong writer all semester long, um, but not as comfortable with technology. And I asked them to share their creative, um, their acts of creat creative resistance over a platform called Flip. It's a video platform that allows, it's uh, closed. So outside, you know, it's not gonna show up on Google. So it's, there's a degree of privacy for the students that they can expect. Um, and it, it allows them to record videos of up to 10 minutes. It's nice for facilitating discussion and sharing work within a class. And she had created this, this video um, that was not just her sharing the poem, but she'd actually gotten really involved with the graphics and had created, you know, these, the movement of the text in order to enhance um, the presentation of the poem, which I thought was great. And the lead into it is, um, I'm not. I'm not so great with the technology stuff, but one thing I do know is words. And so I have this to share with you. And, and to me, it was, it was pretty great that she was so motivated to overcome um, the difficulty that she had with technology in order to share this, to share this work. So I, I, I found it highly motivating for them. So with these projects, are you finding that students are choosing topics or discussing groups that they personally identify with? Like, do they, did you get the sense that they felt like maybe they were underrepresented and they wanted to share with the class like things about things that were important to them? Yeah, I, I can give a, an example of that. I actually had a student um, who was pretty quiet all semester, but um, he, but he watched the survivor testimony, you know, in, in the exhibit. Um, and he thought a little bit about how he had to connect that to his own recent experiences. And he, he decided he wanted to start a mental health clinic just for men uh, where men could could cry 
and could share stories. And and he went and he he just gave this history of his family and the cultural stereotypes and um his own feelings during COVID and how he had no release for them mm-hmm. because of the expectations of himself as a as a male. Um and I so I just thought that was such a brilliant like fusion um of what he had recently gone through and what he was hearing in the emotional um experiences of the survivor testimony and trying to find a solution. So. Yeah, I um so sometimes I think it is is how I would answer that question. I in the creative resistance project I had a lot of students who had been personally affected by the rise in anti-Asian sentiment and Asian hate. And so I had quite a few students who selected projects and or created acts of resistance connected to that and developed projects around that. Um, similarly, I had a number of students who um, had experienced anti-immigrant discrimination and they also um, had a, so they approached that assignment with a personal connection. In terms of the digital exhibit, that's a little bit different because um, it, it kind of tends to go one of two ways. If a student has some sort of personal connection with disability, it almost always has shown up in that assignment. So they will include that as part of their curator's note, but you know they chose to focus on this particular population because something that affects their son or it affects their nephew or um, a cousin. So there was that kind of sharing. Um, when, when that wasn't true, um, when they didn't have a personal connection to disability, what they did often do is choose kind of a, like a, a different kind of personal connection. So they weren't connected to the population, but they were connected to an interest. And then they, they used that to ground the presentation. So for example, um, students who were focusing on disabled artists were often themselves artists. And so they found that connection really powerful or students that were focusing on um, athletes who had disabilities were themselves athletes. So they made kind of a different kind of personal connection. Add to that a little bit. Um, I also found that in that final research project I give about the not- mock nonprofit, a lot of the students walk away um, being very critical of their generation, like, like, what's wrong with us? Like, what, why aren't we doing more? And so one student wanted to create an organization just devoted to outreach to his, um, to his, his, to his generation. And every time there was a disaster somewhere in the globe, like to, for the, (laughs) to alert his generation about their location and then what they could do um, in their, in their immediate um, environment. I thought that was very telling that it was this assignment was getting into their conscience. Wow. Yeah. Coming back to this idea of trauma, how did students handle being immersed in topics that were highly traumatic and disturbing, like the camps exhibit themes or Dr. Harper's experiences? Did they um, discuss that experience of, of being around that type of material? Did it seem like it was an issue for them or did you get the sense that they were they had found coping strategies for being immersed in the work? Um, Well, so far, my students have been um, experiencing the exhibit virtually, and I have to say it's been very powerful. Um, Some of them have have cried in the classroom as they're as they're watching it. But I think with the focus on finding something that they can that that response is important and to use that response as part of their journey towards figuring out how to solve problem has been very um, beneficial for them. Um, Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, We've just started with Harper's memoir. And I think that 
I anticipate that some of what she talks about will have been experienced by the students personally. Um, and so I am glad to be able to be teaching that text in an in-person format so that I can be more present for that and um, figure out ways to respond to that. Um, the past, when I've done the acts of creative resistance assignment and the interaction with the KHC exhibit, it has previously been in the fully online class. And so my, because my classes are asynchronous, I'm not witnessing how the students are reacting in the moment. I will say that because I'm aware of the fact that that material is, is pretty heavy, um, I tried to build in a lot of um, like invitations for emotionally checking in and um, encouraging students to engage in self-care. And I did that in, in some different ways. Um, I started off the semester sort of by giving them um, the whole first week of the class was basically thinking about, you know, their, their journeys as learners. Um, I used, um, I, I used Spotify in those classes, playlists, and that was a very kind of emotionally, every week the students had to do, a, it was a weekly check-in assignment. So every week they had to share a song that was connected to some sort of concept with the class and explain why they had shared it. So I think that made room for students' emotions. Um, and sometimes they were sharing, you know, that they were going through something or feeling something. I, I felt like there was a lot more sharing of that kind. Um, I also used the, the flip posts that I asked st students to complete every week. And uh, I think three of the flip posts, you know, most of the time I, I tend to be very like, let's focus on the work, let's read the text. Um, but the, uh, I made three of those posts, check-ins where I asked students to, you know, just tell me how they were doing, tell their classmates how they were doing. Um, I also asked them to, like, I asked them a question that sort of prompted an action. I said, what nice thing are you doing for yourself this week? And so then I, I found like the students were, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to do this for myself this week. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't have a good sense of how they were affected in the moment. And it'll be really interesting to see that um, in person this semester, especially now, because I think the last few years, people have been through so much collective trauma. It will be interesting to see how this resonates. All right. Well, thank you both so much for a great presentation and a great discussion. And uh, we will see you next Wednesday for the next event in our NEH um, colloquium series.